Cover right. live. Now, now we're really live on YouTube. This is the Samani e course for iTech, uh, digital identity, campus Guadalajara, September 26th to 30th. We have uh, Lee here and we have Laura here. And I just cut Lee off to remember to hit the start broadcast button. So now I'll shut up again. Go ahead, Lee. Um, yeah, so when we talk about digital presence, and um, I'm, I, I wear lots of different hats in my role. So my official title is Instructional Technology Specialist at the University of Mary Washington. Uh, and what that means is I uh, help faculty incorporate technology and think through such things as their own um, digital presence and digital identity so that they can help their students think through their digital presence and digital identity. Um, so what we want, so what, what we're really thinking about is this, for me, an intersection between faculty roles who are, who discipline, but also thinking about what does it mean to have a digital presence as a sociologist or as a biologist or as an engineer um, or as a computer science, et cetera, et cetera. And then the other the other piece is that I um, teach uh, in the digital studies program. And so I just ran from teaching my intro to digital studies, which is in large part thinking through um, all the different uh, kinds of digital presences. Uh, they, they, he, um, uh, Ken shared out um, the, the DGST101.net site that we've created for it that explores a lot of these issues and also the implications of these issues. But for me, um, I, I really agreed with what, and I'm going to steal her thunder here by saying, you know, the idea of it being, um, it, it's, uh, it's an integrated identity for me, right? Like some people have very cordoned off um, digital uh, presences where they're a different person in different places or a different part of themselves is presented in different places. And I think, but with, and sometimes we do this in, in real life. I mean, I wear lots of hats. I'm a mother, I'm a swim coach, I'm a swim mom, I'm a dance mom, um, uh, I'm a wife, I'm all of these different kinds of things. Um, and so different parts of my life come out in those different physical spaces. Uh, and it's, what's interesting to me is that digitally, um, it's one of the few places where I've actually been able to embrace all of those facets of myself um, and communicate it in a much more coherent way than I feel like I've ever been able to communicate it um, in real life, in physical spaces, where in physical spaces I'm always expected or there are certain expectations placed upon me um, because of my gender, because of my role, because of my race, because of all of these kinds of things. Um, not that that doesn't happen online, but uh, I was able to really be able to integrate that and be um, a lot of different things online in a way that um, I didn't feel like I could be, particularly when I was in a faculty role. Um, it's a lot easier now in, a, in an outside of that role. So that was really meandering and sort of confusing. So um, I'll just leave it at that, and then you can ask me all the questions or just look at me with your head to the side and kind of like, what is she talking about? <laughs> Hi, Greg, Gogia, and to piggy piggyback off of what Lee just said, um, I also wear a lot of hats. Uh, I am not in a traditional faculty role. In fact, if I had to choose like my primary role as far as where I spend most of my time during the week, it's um, a government job. So I work for the State Council for Higher Education for Virginia. I'm building reports um, that lead government policy around education, but also social services. So that's my main job. Um, but I also I do educational when people have research projects and they, they need extra manpower. I, I am the, the manpower or the woman power. Um, but to piggyback off of what Lee said, um, the digital, my digital identity is completely integrated into everything I, I do. Um, and in fact, in many, in many ways, it's the, the one thing that remains steady through my day. And I think probably one of the best examples of I, that I have of that right now is that if you look behind me, this space, government building, it's not even in my office. 
okay, um, I work in a cubicle, and in order to do this in the middle of my work day, because it's 12 o'clock here, I had to find a physical space where I wouldn't be bothering other people. And so this is a random office down the, the hallway from my cubicle. And so I have these interludes through the day where I'm speaking with, class, with classes or I'm um, commenting on student blogs because I do connected learning coaching part of the time. Um, and I'm doing them from very disparate types of physical spaces. So I am my digital presence while I'm standing in the grocery line, or I am my digital presence while I'm in a random empty office down the hallway from my cubicle. Um, so that's kind of where I was getting at, where I, I'm not even sure I could separate out, or I'm my digital presence while I'm putting my kids to bed and I'm sitting there um, typing to Lee, uh, and DMing in Twitter while I'm waiting for my daughter to go to sleep. My digital presence is really, like what I do online, my digital identity is really me. Maybe even more uh, holistically than what I am in my physical life, which might be kind of dystopic, and we can talk about that, or I'll think about it a little bit more. Um, but anyway, that's, I think, all I have to say, too. So that, that made Lee look very on point and direct. Uh, I think I was even more meandering. So <laughs> what are we talking about now, Ken? <laughs> give us some guidance I, here. I, I, unmute yourself. <laughs> Ken, uh, give us some guidance, man. <laughs> which crunchy food did you bring to the office today, Laura? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Which loud and crunchy food did you bring today? Uh, I have carrots, actually. Uh, but the bad part was I, I brought tuna, and that really, really, I, I worry about that because, you know, the smell of tuna. So I ate it really, really fast before I came in so that no one could down the hallway. Um, yeah. So that, that's a great question, Ken. What else you got? <laughs> what else you got, kids? One, one thing I was wondering is, is Lee mentioned um, the kind of shift from being in faculty mode and I think the students struggle with what should they write about? I mean, they find it, I think, weird to write about what they're doing with schoolwork and, and exposing themselves. And, and is that cheating? Because in most of their classes, they're not allowed to share what they're doing. Whereas in most of my classes, it's this weird thing where I want them all to share. And I think some of them are struggling with that. Thoughts on that? I, I, I have a lot of thoughts on that. You, I know you have a lot of thoughts on that. Do you want to share your thoughts on that and then I'll, I'll chime in? Well, I, I, from my perspective, um, I started my blogging as a student. Um, I started it as a graduate student and it became something that I did every week um, as my, my teachers and my advisors expected it from me. So I really did start this from a student angle. And what do you write about every week? And sometimes it's a matter of looking at what you've read this week and trying to synthesize it with everything else that you're doing as well and trying to make sense of what you're reading. And in that way, it becomes a... Um, a traceable document of your learning and you're recording the different things and summarizing what you've done and trying to connect it all together to make a big picture and it doesn't necessarily have to be deeply meaningful um, but then every once in a while you'll you something will click and whatever it is you've written like wow what I'm learning right now it it it, it gets to me on a deeper level. It, it reminds me of something from my childhood. It makes me think about something that's happening in my community. And that's when things start coming together, where you're taking all of these little snippets that you've been reading and observing and thinking about, and it will consolidate into a really important kind of mile post type blog post. So net, not every blog post needs to be huge or meaningful. It's just every once in a while, it'll all come together and you will write this kind of, it almost feels like a manifesto. It's like, wow, that's a cool blog post. That is meaningful to me. So no stress. Like it doesn't, it doesn't have to be deeply meaningful or big every single time you write something. Nice. Yeah, I, 
So for me, like it's I if you look at my Twitter profile and I put my Twitter handle under there, my pinned tweet on my profile is um, that I literally wrote myself into existence. Um, and we write really publicly now, but I mean, I can remember when I was uh, in college and the internet was a new thing back in the mid nineties um, and we were just starting to get access. And so I, I wrote for a zine, um, it, bef there was before there were blogs, there were like webzines uh, that started off as a list serve. Um, but I also wrote um, for myself. I wrote in journals. I wrote about what I, what I was learning. I wrote about what I was doing. I wrote, um, when I should have been listening in classes during lectures, I wrote, um, and again, there was, a, it's exactly what Laura was talking about is that it, most of it was, uh, drivel. Um, but, uh, it was there and it was meaningful for me and often things would come out, um, and I would make those connections. It's this idea of metacognition, right? Writing and writing about what you're learning and writing about what, you're doing is a form of metacognition. It's a way for your brain um, to process, but also to get that stuff out, to get it um, in the open, to see it, to be able to make those connections. Now, um, we can do it a little bit more publicly. So not only can we make connections with our own ideas, we can make connections with other people's ideas. We read people's blogs, we connect them to our blogs or our writings or our podcasts or whatever it is. It doesn't even have to be text anymore. Um, we can do series of GIFs, right, that reflect just how we're feeling in a particular class. I mean, I am all about writing about what we learn and writing about what we do. And when it comes to putting the personal stuff in your post, um, learning is supposed to be personal. Um, learning has been depersonalized. Learning has been um, turned into metrics and ticks on boxes and completion and that. But learning is a deeply, deeply personal thing if we are going to really learn something, right? It's got to hook into us on a very, very deep level. I just finished telling my students because I have, we talk about assessment and we talk about, well, how are we going to assess this strange project that I'm asking you to do? And so they're sitting there waiting for me to tell them um, that what they've come up with is okay. It's like, is this what you're looking for? And I said, ultimately, my goal with this assignment is, yes, there are these outcomes that deal with digital studies and that. But at the end of the day, what I want them to do is to come up with a project um, and engage in a form of learning that is deeply meaningful for them um, and that has value for them, intrinsic value for them, right? And so to say that, um, you know, that, that, that you, you always have to be depersonalized um, particularly when you talk about your own learning, I think is a, is a fallacy. And I'm not saying you have to overshare, um, and we all have to negotiate our own personal boundaries, and those boundaries change, and they also involve other people, right? I'm married and I have kids, and so I have to be respectful of the wishes and the privacy of my husband. I overshare, he's deeply private. Um, I also have to respect the agency of my own children who are getting who are old enough now to voice opinions on this where my daughter loves it when I share things and my son hates it and so he I took a ridiculous picture of him and he loved that I took the picture but he said mommy don't post it anywhere right and that's respecting other people's boundaries as well I'm not alone in this I'm not um, individual I, the decisions I make on what to share uh, impact other people and those th that's always a constant negotiation. There's no one right answer for everyone but I would say that to To think that nothing personal will ever get shared particularly when we're talking about our learning um, It 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 just means that we're not actually doing the learning. We're we're not we're ticking boxes, right? We're ticking boxes not um, Getting to the heart of the matter and, and getting to a point where we're building new knowledge um, because again, that's a deeply, deeply personal thing for everyone. Right. So while Lee was talking, a couple of things came to mind. Um, you know, I think it's a very valid question. You know, I, I think everyone should should write things down, but decide. You know, in order to make them concrete and to reflect on them and have a record of your own learning. But that writing down of our learning and make it. Um, um, I, I think that's certainly a personal decision, and you have to think about the pros and cons for you. Now, some of the things 
about the, the pros of making it public that you may not even consider until you're in the middle of it and it's happening to you is that these amazing opportunities will emerge when you make your learning visible and, and public. Like for example, I don't like to sit down and read 30 page articles. Um, I don't know about you, maybe your attention spans are longer than mine, but a lot of them are boring and I can't handle it. So when I was in grad school, it's like, okay, how am I going to get through this reading? And so I started taking notes on the reading through tweets, live tweet whatever article or chapter I was reading um, because taking those notes uh, helped me get through the chapter and remember what I was reading. Well, I was doing that one day and the authors of the article were happened to be on Twitter at that time and I had um, connected it to them. I, I knew who they were and so I was using their Twitter handles. Well, they popped up and they found it enormously interested picking up from their article what I wasn't and how I was interpreting it and suddenly what had turned into a from a very private exercise of me just taking notes on my reading turned into an actual conversation with the authors of the article which I mean is is huge I, I learned so much I also gained friends I also turned it into a, a Twitter journal club that netted me articles I was I, I wrote articles on it I've done conference um, presentations on it like it was professionally it was a, a huge moment for me so when you take your things public it gives you an opportunity to meet the people who are also talking about these things and it takes the learning to a whole different level. So that was the first thing I was thinking is like that is a very good reason to put yourself out there. Um, going to what Lee was saying as far as when you are deciding to talk about personal stuff versus uh, keeping it completely unpersonal, you know, I, I write a lot of personal stuff on my blog post. I mean, if you if you skim my blog. Um, at all, you would see a lot of stuff um, about my professional situation, about uh, what happened after I finished my PhD. There's all kinds of personal stuff on there. And, um, you know, I've been blogging now for about four or five years. So trying to figure out that balance of what I'm comfortable with and what, what I like to see is something that has changed over, over time. Um, at this point, I tend to put personal stuff out there when I feel like others can benefit from it if to the other side of it and I can get some perspective on it. I'm like, you know what, I, I have something to say that could be helpful to other people. And, and that's what I put on my blog. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not just sitting there complaining I, unless I'm working through something, unless I think I've had a solution, you know, that that's when I start putting things up there. Um, as far as my kids and my family, yeah, my husband reads my blog posts, um, especially if there's family stuff. I have him take a look at it before I put it up um, because whether or not I can post them or not. I have, uh, you know, a lot of times there are our family and I put up a, um, a website of her photos together. Like she helped design it for me. So, um, yeah, especially if you're going to talk about other people, it's a good idea to talk to them and engage them in the process. Ken has a question. It's popping up. You can't see it. It's in the group chat over here on cyber oh. cheating. They can see it. It's right here on the side. <gasps> okay, on. good. It's not so cheating anymore. You can't read it so much, probably. So can you ask it, Fredel? Because I'm yeah, sure. holding mic for a Sure. Loud because so she can hear it. Yes. They can hear it. Hi. <laughs> Which struggles have you encountered as a woman and a lover? How do you face them? Oh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I'll I'll deal with this first. Um, so my uh, I I had a fairly high profile blog on um, InsideHigherEd.com, which is one of the biggest higher education um, news outlets. Uh, in the States here. Um, and uh, 
one of the that I embodied a lot of it wasn't just that I was a woman it was that I was in a contingent faculty position which means that I was um, uh, you know I was at a lesser status within the university I was at a um, low profile public state university that served a very poor population of students and so in the prestige hierarchy I was low down so there was a lot of things sort of stacked on and stacked up on me uh, in terms of my identity and they um, uh, you know they I got I got it in the comments right there were people who hate read me right they hate read me and it didn't matter what I said um, they were just going to eviscerate what it was that I was going to say um, and one of the things that I found um, that helped the most was the community that I had formed Right, I had a supportive community online around me, and so I didn't have to. And it wasn't like vicious, like total trolling and any of that kind of stuff. It was never the next level stuff. It was more kind of academic pettiness, uh, but it still hurt. Um, I'll admit it. It was hard, and for a while, I had a lot of trouble blogging because I was always thinking about those people who were going to hate on the blog rather than the people who I knew who benefited from what I had to say because it was important, I was an important voice to have and to hear and that there were people who related to it. Um, but my community, like they, I would tweet out, I'm like, hey, the person's back. And then I didn't have to do anything with the people who supported me, who agreed with me, who um, valued what it was I had to say, um, they stepped in. Um, they would step in in the comments, they would support me on Twitter, they would support me on back channels. Um, you know, that, that community support was really important uh, in, in that sort of way. And so that was one of the ways that I really was able to get through that was I had a strong community around me. Um, but that's not to say that's a, that's a really good question because it does, um, uh, it is difficult, it is challenging, and it does, um, it does take a toll. Um, and, you know, I don't blog it inside higher ed anymore. Um, there are there are good reasons for that, and sometimes it is there. There's a downside to the very public, uh, high profileness of it. And I'm actually, you know, I wouldn't trade it for anything because it got me the job that I have now and the position that I have now, and that's the reason I'm talking to you now. Um, but I'm kind of happy. I was just on my my personal blog, and it's like, oh look, four people were there. You know, I'm kind of happy about that. Right, because for me at this point, I think it's for people who matter a lot more than maybe the couple thousands of people who were just reading me because um, they wanted to attack me. So, uh, you know, audience and scope, I think, is something you want to think about as well. Why am I doing this? Um, is it for fame and fortune, or is it to connect and build a community? Um, you know, and and those are things that that really have to that have to weigh because at a certain point. If, it, if you're not getting from it what it is that you set out to get or what you need from it, then that's the time when you have to sort of sit there and evaluate, do I need to move someplace else? Um, do I need to stop, do this for a while and reevaluate? Are there other platforms in which that I can engage? And, and I've seen this a lot with, um, with uh, particularly women, uh, people of color, uh, marginalized communities are moving off of, say, Twitter um, and having closed Facebook groups, right? Like this is where we are gonna act. We found our people, um, but Twitter is, sucks for us now, or blogging sucks for us now, so we're just gonna take it to a closed space, like a Facebook group, like a Slack channel. Yeah, I was right? gonna mention Slack. Slack. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it's, it's about being, you know, we talk about blogging, and I think blogging is great, but I think you're right, that's a really good question, but one of the nice things about now is that we have options. Right? We just have to look at those things and decide where are the spaces, where are my people, um, where can my people go, my group, my community, um, where can we go that we can be safe and do the things and find the things that we need to do um, for the audience that we want to have um, and achieve the goals that we're trying to do, which is learning, growing, connecting, um, whatever it is. There's no wrong answer to that. Um, but it really gets to be a decision of what is it that I'm trying to do and what is it that I'm trying to accomplish. And again, that's always a negotiation and an, evolu and an evolutionary process. Yeah, I mean, a lot of us are on a lot of different platforms all at the same time, depending on who we're engaging with and what we're talking about. So the idea of just blogging or just tweeting, um, 
or just working in Slack channels or just working on Facebook uh, doesn't really cut it anymore because with each thing that you're doing, exactly what Lee said, you have to know your priorities, you have to know your, your goals, you have to know your safety risks or what you're trying to achieve, and then you pick the platform specifically for that. And a lot of times what that means is that you're working across multiple platforms. Like Ken the other day was talking to somebody, he was talking to me in Twitter, he was talking to someone else on Facebook, and he was talking to someone else in a, in a Slack <laughs> channel. He was talking to me on Facebook. <laughs> You are on Facebook, yeah. So, yeah. So the the point is, is that we we tend to work in different plat um in different platforms, and it's not so much we have different personalities in each platform; it's that we're using them for different types of the, of communication. And and we, I mean, we negotiate these things in real life, right? You're you go to a coffee shop for certain kinds of conversations. You go to a closed conference room for other kinds of conversations. Um, you know, you close the bedroom door for other kinds of conversations, right? There, are, you know, we we negotiate our spaces uh, in real life. Maybe not as well as we should, um, but we're making these decisions even when. Um, we're having face-to-face -face conversations. We pull people aside, we lower our voices, we close doors if we can. Sometimes that's a really privileged space to be in as well, to have privacy, to be able to close doors. Um, but uh, nonetheless, we're starting to see that more and more that's happening uh, online. Um, it's why I think, if I've figured it out properly, um, kids love the Snapchat um, because they feel it's a private space for them. Um, but rightly or wrongly, right? We can talk about security issues and that, but they really do feel that Snapchat is something more private, um, more, um, oh, what's the word that I'm talking about? Like it's there and then it's gone, right? That's the, there's an impermanence to it um, as opposed to Facebook or something like that. So it becomes more like a conversation, right? Between a listener and a hearer and then it's gone. It's not recorded. It's something in memory, but it's not something concrete. Right. Unless someone um, screenshot it. In, yeah, unless someone, yeah, and there's all of that kind of stuff. But um, hey, somebody could be secretly recording. I live in a state where you're allowed to do that. As long as one party knows they're being recorded, then it's legal. You know, there's always, always sort of been these risks. Um, but, but again, right, it, it's thinking through. And that's always, I'm, like, I'm fascinated, even if I don't understand it, like, where are the kids today? Right. Um, and I'm, I'm talking about, you know, undergraduates in particular, where are they, right? Um, to be able to do that, we couldn't, we can't see it. It's a tiny screen. Hold on, let's make it big. Okay, try it again. About community. It'll be, it'll be easier for me to read it. So, okay. Uh, <laughs> hi, I'm Ken. Hi. Uh, how do hi, you Ken. start a community? How do you what? How do you start a community? Oh. <laughs> Yeah, so I used to give lectures on this to faculty. Um, <laughs> I do same too. question. <laughs> you know, I think it's it. I, so in the connected learning literature, they talk about this idea of a person personal learning network. So the idea that you are creating people um, communities of people where you can share your work, where you can give them feedback on their work, where you share resources and news and information. Um, across a, a bunch of different goals. So that's a personal learning network. And there's been a, some research in how people start personal learning networks, and it really comes down to having someone to seed your network. So to have somebody who already knows the community who can introduce you into the community, and so you can start making your own connections exactly the same as going to a cocktail party or going to an academic conference. Those things tend to be a lot more meaningful if you're going with someone who already knows different people and they can point people out and they can introduce you and, and, and get you started. So that concept of seating. Oh no, did we lose her? It does, sorry? is really in it. Digital space uh, can look, so seeding can look exactly like it does in real life. So there can be someone on Twitter who's literally production 
um, hi, so-and-so meet so-and-so, I think you guys could talk about this. So it can look like that, or it can be you following someone who you know or respect and seeing who they're talking to and then you start following those people and you start watching the conversation and you start learning who is talking about what and then um, providing them making yourself useful you know providing them with information or knowledge when they they need something Laura isn't that how you and I met that John introduced us on yeah Twitter? I think so I think so. And then I introduced you to like seven. My, my advisor people. introduced me to Lee. Yeah, uh, in that sort of way. And then I connected you with a whole bunch of people in that way too. I'm like, hey, because I would see people who are working on something. One of the things that I'm, one of my strengths is I'm really good at, at connecting people, right? Where I follow a lot of different kinds of people. Um, I'm what they would call a connector in, the, in that sort of language where I follow a lot of different kinds of people and for some reason I'm able, I can't hold anything else in my head, but for whatever reason, your research interest will stick in there and I will see somebody tweeting or sharing an article about something and I will know, oh, Laura will be interested in that, right? Like I have a Rolodex of Laura's the connected learning person and I have the selfie people and I have the net prov people and I have the, all of these that I see something and I know who to broadcast it to. Um, so you, you want to find the connectors, right? That's something that you want to be looking for. Who is consistently tweeting or retweeting or seems to be introducing people within these various networks? Like who, who are the connectors um, in that kind of way? And it might not be that they're really high right. profile people, um, but, they, but they'll connect you. They know all the people where you're just kind of like, look, I'm not really a part of this community, but I know who all of those people are. And so, and I know the people who are friendly and the people that you shouldn't start with. Like I know the people who are just not interested and the kind of gatekeepers. And I know the people who are friendly and who will let you in and those kinds of things. And there's all, I'm, you know, I'm not unique. Um, there are lots of different kinds of connectors out there um, who, who can. And it, it's not them. necessarily the instructor. Yeah. Um, a lot of times it's peers. Because and you have people who know communities who have specialties across different contexts. And so a lot of times you can get good information from your peers um, as well as your instructors. Now, technically, John introduced me to Lee. John was my um, dissertation advisor. Um, so technically, that's a situation where my instructor actually helped me out and introduce me to something, someone, but I'll be honest with you, um, mostly I, I introduce John to other people all the time. Yeah. So, it, you know, it, getting to know your peers and who they know and what their other experiences are um, and really listening to what they're saying and engaging them just opens up a whole world of finding people, other people to talk to and, and getting other resources. So I, I can't stress that enough. It's not just the instructor. Yeah, and and the other thing, and this is something that um, you alluded to, but I, uh, Laura, but I really want to emphasize, and I think it's something that we lose track of now within social media circles. Hey, uh, welcome to the front. Um, is um, is is this idea of listening right? Uh, and and we don't call it listening; we call it wasting time on the internet. Uh, but. I, I really do believe that particularly once you start following people, right, you find the people on Twitter, on Facebook, you follow their blogs, you follow their tweets, you follow the hashtag conversations, and you listen, right? You don't have to jump in immediately. Um, and you find out where you can fit, right? You, you sort of pay attention. And again, maybe this is just the, the skill that I've developed um, from being weird and awkward. Uh, but you know, you sort of listen in and you see, okay, these are the people, this is the smaller group within that sub-community um, that, that I can befriend, that I feel comfortable with, that look like me, sound like me, have similar other interests. You know, um, Ken and I are both Canadian and we're both big hockey fans, right? So even if I can't figure out how to connect with him about our shared interest in connected learning, I can be like, did you catch the hockey game last night? <laughs> Right, and we have an affinity in that sort of way that can lead to a level of trust that allows you to get into the the community group. So listening um, is a really really important thing. And again, they'll call it wasting time on the internet. 
Um, but I call it, you know, I call it deep listening in terms of paying attention to these things and seeing where it is you can fit in and how you can get in there and, and build those kinds of things. Who are my people? Um, is, is this just because you have one shared interest doesn't mean they're your people, unfortunately. Um, but it's trying to figure out, are, are these my people? Are these, and then figuring out how to, how to get into that. Awesome. We have a question. Uh, my question is a little bit on, on everything that you talked about. You told us that we can really talk about anything on your blog. My question is, is it a good thing to be uh, have a popular uh, digital identity? I mean, isn't it more unsafe? Mm. Risks of being popular. Yeah, I mean, that. isn't it unsafe because people could know where you live or who your family is and stuff like that? I mean, what are the benefits of actually having a popular digital identity right so so you have to decide what to post online and what not to you can, in the back of your mind you've always got to know what you're posting um, and and it's it's a calculated risk to a certain extent I mean honestly when you're talking about what you're learning you know, as far as what you're reading, how it connects to other things you've read, uh, that's not stuff that I, I think is, is unsafe at all. Um, when you're talking about your family, you know, again, you have to look at it in the context of what's already online. Versus what people can find out anyway. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's person dependent. Uh, you also have to look at the uh, chances of it being risky. I, I mean, Lee had a much has a much more popular blogging identity than I do. Um, you know, I'm lucky if 150 people look at my blog. Um, yeah. Something. So you know, it that's it, it's not as if there's tons of people trafficking through my space. Um, so, you know, it is something I consider before putting something up about my family. It is something I consider when um, I tell the world on Twitter that I am going um, on vacation, which means my house might be empty. Um, you know, it's stuff, it's stuff I think about, but you also have to think about the fact that a lot of this stuff is already available online if people are targeting you. Lee, do you have a, another answer for that? Um, I'm just actually trying to look for a resource that was recently shared um, uh, about how to protect yourself from these kinds of things. If you're going to get, um, not gaslit, but trolled or um, those kinds of things um, to protect yourself online. I mean, there are steps you can take. There's nothing wrong with being pseudo-anonymous. Uh, mm -hmm. in those kinds of things. I mean, these are all very personal decisions. And, and again, I would ask the question, what's popular? Right? What do you mean by popular? Um, why do you want to be popular? Right? Um, you know, like I said, like I had a really popular blog and you were saying, <laughs> Laura, you're saying um, you're lucky if 150 people look at your blog. Well, now I'm lucky if 150 people look at my blog too. Um, but they are... Hey, Lee, I'll look at it twice. Okay. So 152. 152. There we go. Um, but, but again, it's this, it's this question and, and of... Um, you know, why, why are we looking for popularity? And yes, there is an incredible amount of capital that you can leverage with popularity, right? Um, it gets you exposure. It gets you higher up in terms of prestige in certain circles. It gets you an audience. Um, it gets the attention of people who might not give you any attention otherwise. Um, and that can be a really <laughs> good thing. Um, all of my jobs have come from my Twitter presence. Yeah, all of mine too. From an economic yeah. standpoint. All of my jobs, I have been hired because people knew me from Twitter. I have keynoted international conferences because of my Twitter and blog presence. So there, there can be a very real economic and intellectual value to this sort of thing. Yeah, um, but it, but just, but to, it's a, but it's a personal thing. But right, right. It's, it's. Um, you know, and I'm, and it also depends on your personality, like in terms of oversharing. And, and there's, there's a risk, but there's a risk of, you know, I, I tell people this all the time that they're like, well, I don't want to put anything online about myself. It's like, are, are you in a university directory? 
then people know your email address and uh, where your office is and where you're going to be from nine to five every day if you're in a university directory. Um, you know, these are, this, this is the reality we live. This isn't to say that we should be maybe not okay with that or um, those kinds of things, but it particularly those who say, I don't want ever anything at all ever to be online. And I'm like, I can go to your university's, you know, directory right now and know uh, an awful lot about you uh, in, in that kind of way. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it opens, it opens you up. Um, you know, uh, in, in those kinds of ways. And for some people, and there are people who are more at risk than others. Um, but, mm -hmm. but again, the question is always like, what do I mean by popular? Do I mean a million people? Do I mean viral? Do I mean um, popular within a small network of people who have, shared, who have a shared interest? Um, those are very, very different levels of, of popularity. And I mean, I was, everybody says I was, I was academic Twitter famous, which really it's like, I all you know, like it's a low bar. Like let's just put that out there. Um, but it's a bar, right? It's a bar. It's a low <laughs> one. Um, you know, academic Twitter famous. Woo. Uh, but but it afforded me a lot of opportunities that I will forever be grateful for, um, and to be able to do both professionally but also personally, right? Like I would not have gotten through five years living in the middle of nowhere um, without my network you know, without my network and without um, the support of the people that I met because I had a popular blog. And I got a popular blog because of the people I met. So there's, there's that circularity to it as well that it feeds off of each other. So, I wonder if that's a non-answer. You, you can change things over time. So I know people who were much more open in the past, like when they had a different job, for example, and then they, they transferred into to another job where perhaps it might be as about their political, what they were putting on Twitter changed over time. So this, this concept of being very open versus being much more closed, you know, that's, that's dynamic. That's something that you can shift through time, depending on your, your context and what you need from your network. And so it gets back to this, this question of you should constantly be questioning, what am I doing, am I doing it, and is this working for me? Um, and you answer those questions and move forward um, depending on your answer. So I want to address that question about how their stuff is good enough to share. Um, so this is a story that I love to tell. Um, is that so I start blogging at inside higher ed um, and like I say I am um, a woman I am from a different country so I'm international even though a lot of people don't assume that about me um, I like I said I live in the middle of nowhere I work at a no place institution I am in a lesser position in terms of the academic hierarchy and a contingent faculty position um, and I have this huge platform now on Inside Higher Ed. Uh, and I say what some people would consider inflammatory things, right, about contingency, about the state of higher education, about the state of education generally, um, about what it's like to be a woman in higher education, um, about what it's like to be poor and working class in higher education, um, all of these kinds of things. And so I go for dinner at one point um, with uh, the editor of Inside Higher Ed. And it, I was still fairly new. I was still fairly new on the blog. And he said that he was getting angry emails and phone calls from like senior people at big universities, white male, uh, senior people at the universities going, who the hell does this girl think she is? Right? Um, you know, really, like, why the hell is she there, and who the hell does she think she is? And the, the my editor is great because he'll take you out for dinner and he'll buy you lots of wine. Um, so I'd had a couple of glasses of wine, and I just blurted out, and so excuse my language, but I just blurted out, and I'm like, I'm fucking nobody, and that's the point, right? Is that um, you can't take what other people are going to say is valuable um, because they are only going to value the same things that they have always valued, 
right? There is never going to be anything new to be said unless we find the courage to say those things, to embody our realities and to talk about them, right? One of the, you know, there was, there was a, a tense irony as the more popular I got, I stopped being a nobody, um, which I think shifted my own voice. But but, you know, I blogged from a position of being a fucking nobody, right? I'm not anyone. But at the same time, I was the majority of people in higher education, right? Most students in the United States don't go to giant, prestigious liberal arts colleges. They don't go to Harvard. They don't go to Yale. They don't go to Ohio State even. Um, they go to the places where I taught. Most faculty aren't tenure, tenure track faculty anymore. They're contingent faculty. And so, you know, you don't think you have anything to say because those people who have a vested interest in controlling the conversation have convinced you that you have nothing to say because they don't want to hear it because it upsets their worldview. And you got to upset that worldview. You always have something valuable to say. You always have something valuable to contribute um, because nobody has ever said it the way you can. So I think you guys are having Alan Levine come in later today even, or maybe it's tomorrow. And that would be a great question for him as well, as far as asking him um, what's good enough to share. Because he and I have discussed it at length, and you know we blog for ourselves. Uh, our audience, our primary audience is ourself. So if it's good enough to share with yourself, then it's good enough to share. It's and I, think and that's I mean, all I I'm, yeah, well, and, it, and it's amazing. I mean, one of the things, like, I've, when I've started writing for myself more again, and if you go to my personal blog, it's much more personal than it has been, than my writing has been in a long time. And um, it's the most personal and scary things that I have published, um, the most intimate things in the, in, the, in the more French European way than the Anglo centric way of saying intimacy, ain't sim. Um, for those who are French in the in the crowd, um, where that they have resonated the most with people, that you know people will reach out to me and thank me for writing it, um, something that uh, I think might be ridiculous uh, even or embarrassing to write about. In again, that that kind of like I'm a grown ass woman and shouldn't be writing about this stuff. Uh, <laughs> you know, all of these, um, all of the, all of them end up being the ones that resonate the most with people and who reach out to me, mm -hmm. who find my email address, who track me down to email me and say, thank you. Thank you for writing this. Um, I wrote a post this summer about, and, and Laura, this will resonate with you too. Um, I wrote a post this summer about uh, wearing a two-piece bathing suit um, and body issues and class issues around all of those kinds of things. And all of a sudden people were writing response posts and sharing themselves in not even a two piece, but just a bathing suit and something that they hadn't wanted to do and didn't feel comfortable doing. And then they're like, look at me, I'm in a bathing suit. Thank you so much for writing that. And like, you know, I, that happened because I wrote about something that other people might think, well, that's stupid and trivial and you shouldn't write about that. Right. They shouldn't talk about that. I wrote a response post to your bathing suit post. Yeah, and I wrote about talking about body image um, with my daughter. So um, yeah, it's it's amazing how those personal posts can really strike a chord, and those are the ones like my recent um, blog post about um, uh, being uh, let go from my job and uh, the PhD, the post PhD slump, those things. Those are the things that have gotten thank yous from people all over the world um, and opened up some really meaningful conversations. Um, but to get to points that other people were bringing up earlier, it's like we write, Lee and I write these things um, because it's meaningful to us, it helps us, it's, it's who we are. Um, but not all blogging has to be like that. And not everyone is going to take that approach to digital presence, and that's totally fine, too. Yeah. I'm finding Laura's post, and I'm going to share it. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Lee, so. Scholar Up, and thanks, Laura. Go get. Um, any other questions before we break off, Laura and Lee? I'm draining them. I'm, I'm overloading them with information. I think you're, you're giving them a massive amount of information to think about today as well. Um, any last 
thoughts, Laura and Lee, why, why, what they should be publishing, how they should be sharing? Whatever you want. Yeah, whatever makes sense to you. Yeah. And with the understanding that if you write something and then you're like, oh gosh, maybe I'm not comfortable with that, then delete it. For goodness sake, I mean, the beautiful thing about this is that you can change what you put up. I mean, the web is a dynamic publishing platform. So write what you want, change what you want, change over time. Just because you decide to be this type of blogger right now doesn't mean that that's what you're going to do in two years. I've changed my blog, oh, so many times. And I've changed addresses, URLs. Um, so many times over the last five years. Um, you're going to change over time. What you decide today is not what you're stuck with. And, and who you are, because in the same way who you are is going to change. You are at one stage in your life right mm -hmm. now as students, and you bring a valuable perspective to that. Um, don't ever, ever let anybody tell you that, that you have nothing to add because you are, quote unquote, just students. That's bullshit. Um, you know, you have, you have everything you need to contribute to the conversation. Um, it's just nobody's ever told you that you can come in and talk, right? Um, the, you know, and that's the great thing about the internet is that you claim your space and you claim that, you claim that um, part of it. Um, and then as you age and as you um, grow up and as you mature and as you change things about your life and in your life, of course what you say is going to change. You should be embarrassed by what you write when you're an undergraduate in 20 years. Hell, I reread some of my undergraduate papers and I'm like, ooh, Lord. And that blog that I was on 20 years ago, I'm like, oh, okay. But I was 19. Um, and some of it, even though how I said it um, is I sounded like a 19 year old. Um, it still was important and it still resonated and there was something actually in the spirit of what I wrote and in the, the freeness of how I wrote it that I was like, gosh, I've lost that in getting older, right? Um, there's, there's always time and there's always space and there is always, always something that you can say uh, in a way that only you can say it. Um, and that's, that's invaluable. Don't ever let anyone tell you that that is not. Um, valuable or it's a waste of time or it's a waste of space or it's a waste of anything it is not awesome excellent wow um, I'd like everyone to thank Laura and Lee for joining us today thank, thank you, you for your valuable time thank you we'll see you thank you Excellent.